Hello, and thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Arthur Bergeron. Uh, I'm an attorney. I do nothing but elder law. I work at a firm called Myrick O'Connell. Myrick O'Connell, there are 60 of us. Everybody there does different things. This is all I do. Um, and thank you for joining us at the Carriage House uh, for another one of the presentations that we've done here. We've done actually several over the last several years um, on a number of topics, but the one that we're talking about today is the one that really affects, among other things, the Carriage House because it is about assisted living. So the question, which Mike, let me tip for, first tell you about who I'm typically talking to um, and then talk to you about their question. My typical clients are Frank and Mary and their children, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And they've li they're living in their home and they've lived there for years and years. Um, and their goal is very simple. Um, uh, they, they've got a home that's worth about $600,000. He has an IRA worth about $200,000. They've got an annuity of about seventy-five, dollars and bank accounts worth about seventy-five. dollars They're not wealthy. They have a little under a million dollars, $950,000. Frank is, living, is getting a Social Security check and a pension check, so his total income is $2,000 a month. Mary is getting half of, um, or, or Mary is getting, Mary worked while she was, um, when she was younger, so she's getting a, uh, a check of $1,000 $1, a month from Social Security. Um, so their total income is $3,500 a month. Uh, they're doing fine. There's no mortgage on their house. They've lived in this house forever, and their goal in life is very simple. They want to die and be buried in the backyard. They, don't want to, they love their house. Their kids have all moved out. They know their neighborhood. They know everybody. Um, so they've got a couple of issues. Uh, first of all, they, they also want to make sure if one of them dies that their uh, husband or wife is going to be safe. Uh, and then they want to know when the two of them have died that everything can be left to the kids. So that's kind of their basic goal in life. What they are also very sure of is, both of them, is they never, ever, ever want to go to a nursing home. So um, they are trying to structure their lives so as to make sure that that doesn't happen. Now, as I tell folks, um, and once again, this is all I do, so I talk, I would say of the clients that I have, 90% of them are either worried about Alzheimer's, or they have Alzheimer's, or somebody that they know has Alzheimer's, so they're worried about in their future, are they, are they going to be safe? Um, and I'll tell them, I'll say, you know, it, you can be at home, and you can be at home for a long time, um, as long as you're safe. But what you never want to do is you don't want to fall down. You don't want to fall down, you don't want to break your hip, you know, because that's kind of all goes in one direction. And from then on, the likelihood of nursing home, which is where everybody doesn't want to be, is really bad. So one of the things that these folks talk about, and that I talk to them about, um, is, is there a point when you're at home that it's really getting to be not that safe? So that you're really, by being home, increasing the likelihood um, that you might end up in a nursing home because you might fall down, you might break something. It gets dangerous. And when you're in that home, is it, well, is it the same home that it was? Like, for example, like, um, for among other things, what Frank and Mary would typically find in the home that they've grown up, raised their kids in and everything else, is that the people in that home have now moved, the people in that neighborhood have now moved away. Many of them are now gone. So the people there are not the same. And maybe they are not getting out as much and socializing because they can't because they're not wanting to drive as much and they're more nervous and there are other people, some of their other people aren't around. So the question is in those kinds of situations or in kind of connected situations, is there a time to look at assisted living? So what I always suggest to clients in this situation is what you want to do when you're thinking about any of these things, whether you're trying to figure out, is there a safe way that I can stay home? Is there some package of things that I can do so that I can stay home? Uh, or do I want to consider assisted living because maybe that's a better alternative? I say, 
talk to a geriatric care manager. Um, geriatric care managers, many people don't e even know that term, but it's, it's really a field that has evolved over the last 15 years, um, where mostly licensed social workers and nurses um, who really like working with older folks have found themselves moving into this basically niche market where they will provide advice and case management and just direction to older folks um, who are trying to figure out exactly this set of issues. They are also, by the way, terrific if you, if you are in a medical facility, if you're dealing with hospitals and, and nursing homes and the whole medical field, they are the best advocates that you can typically find. Often people will call me if they've got an issue regarding any of that and say, what do I do? And I say, go talk to a geriatric care manager. Lawyers can't figure that stuff out because they can't read the charts and don't know what the medicines mean or any of that. So anyway, in this situation, the best person to talk to often is a geriatric care manager because that's a person that's just working for you. You know, they're not working for one of the facilities. They're not, there's, they don't have any other stake in the game except helping you figure out what you need. So around here, um, when people ask about geriatric care managers, you know, as a lawyer, I'm always supposed to like give three recommendations. And I don't, I always give one, you know, here. And it's really this woman, Deb Gittner and her partner, Linda Sullivan, who have been doing this for a number of years. And it's just because they're the best ones. So I tell people to talk to them. So I wanted to have Deb yeah, Deb gets embarrassed when I do this, you know, but Is so. Ah, that's her. That's Deb, Deb Gittner and, and Linda Sullivan are the, are the partners. No, no, that, that's actually not, they're kind of like Frank and Mary, actually. They're friends of Frank and Mary. They're, 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 kind, they're more, they look a lot like, but Frank and Mary look a lot like my parents. Somebody actually pointed out to me that, that yes. And, I, and as a matter of fact, my videographer, who happens to be here, drew Frank and Mary. That's one of his gifts. He actually he drew those characters. Yeah, so, so Deb Gittner is going to talk to you a little bit, bit about that, that, what, in what kinds of situations you may want to look for assisted living and what you want to think about. And pretend when you're listening to them that you're not here because she doesn't work for them, right? So she may be selling some things that you'd find, oh, geez, well, you know, I really need to ask those people here, right? Because the goal of this exercise, when you're thinking about this, is to shop around and to shop around before it's an emergency. So, Deb. Thank you. What else is SW? Licensed Certified Social Worker. A social. And um, that's what LCSW stands for. And I've been a social worker now to do the math. Um, probably, let's see, what am I, uh, about 35 years, I think. 30, 39 years, because I'll be married 39 years this year. So I got married in the same year I got my, my degree. Um, so that's how long I've been doing that. And as far as a geriatric care manager, I have been doing that for about close to 14 years. Linda and I have been in business together. What we are and what we do, as Arthur said, we are geriatric care managers, aging life care professionals. And we are provide a holistic continuum of care approach to our clients. Our clients being the senior who requires some help or some assistance in the situation that they're in. They could be home trying to figure out, what do I do now? The family could be saying, gee, mom or dad or aunt and uncle, a brother or sister or a husband, something's just not right. It could be the memory, it could be a disease that is affecting their ability to make good decisions. It could be that there's other extenuating circumstances. Um, and what do I do? How do I, what do I do? How do I make it happen? And as geriatric care managers, we are, we go into the home or into the facility to complete an assessment to determine the needs of the, of our client, the needs of the senior, to, to then put together a plan of care with some short-term goals and some long-term goals in order to make the situation the best it can be to give the client a high, high quality of life. For example, somebody could be home and not taking the right medications, mixing things up and not remembering what to take. And it could be a simple assessment and suggestions as to how to make that happen. It could be someone who's fallen who needs some help as to figuring out, now they've gone to the hospital, what rehab is the best? 
How do I get into the rehab? Can you help open some doors for me? And do you have any contacts to make that happen? And then again, when they're done with their rehab, now they want to go home, able to go home. How do we make that happen? There's many, many scenarios and situations. This is, this is my high tech lesson. That's forward. Okay. That's backwards. Everything else, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay. So okay. This is um, information on what we do. The education to the family is most important. And uh, resources, we know the resources. We know how you can find a good home care agency. We know what you can do to find a good assisted living. There's many assisted livings. This is a very good assisted livings. But as I say to family members, um, when I go shopping, I may find a blue dress that I like. And it may look beautiful on the hanger, but it may not fit me well. Um, and the same thing, you have to find a facility that's going to match your personality, the personality of, this, of your family member, for it to work and for it to be very successful. As a result of our ability to provide resources and information, it ends up reducing the stress of the family members. And that's important because whenever there's somebody who's ill or who, or who requires care, it's very stressful for everybody. Everybody in the family feels that stress and anxiety to do the best. Um, and the family members are trying to do the best, but oftentimes they don't have the information that Linda and I have. Let me talk a little bit about what is an assisted living. An assisted living is a social model. Here in Massachusetts, which is where we are, it is a social model, not a medical model. Medical models are nursing homes. Assisted livings are social models. And they are designed to meet the needs of the individuals living in their facility. They do this through activities. They do this through assisting and care with activities of daily living, such as help with bathing or grooming or dressing or um, escort service to activities or to the dining room. But again, it is a social model. There, is, there are three different types of models in, the, in Massachusetts. There's the independent, there's the traditional, there's the memory impaired, and what Carriage House offers is a blended community of independent and traditional together, which is really a very nice blend of services. So you don't, as you continue to require more care, you're able to stay here at Carriage House in this blended community. The independent model, no assistance is needed with care. It's often with somebody who may still be driving, who still may want to prepare some meals for themselves, but who doesn't want to be in a house anymore. House has gotten too big, too many repairs, too expensive to worry about snow plowing, yard work, too many phone calls to keep the house going. So that is the independent model. Um, and again, in order to move into the independent model, you're usually pretty sharp and do not require services or help with personal care. The traditional assisted model, there are services there. Most people do require some help with personal care. It can be a little bit of help with showering or bathing with a bath. It could be someone who requires some assistance with dressing, either in the morning or at night, some reminders to take their medications, some escort service to activities. But it's a social model. There's a lot of activities in order to keep someone active. As all the studies show, the more activity, the more social engagement, it's better for the mind and it keeps you very sharp. There are nurses in the building, but they're not there 24-7. Um, in Massachusetts, there, it, because it's a social model, there does not need to be a nurse in the building all of the time. In Massachusetts, the nurse is able to complete an assessment and put together a care plan. In a medical model, the nurses are able to dispense meds, take blood pressure. But in a social model, the nurses are not allowed to take blood pressures or dispense meds. Oftentimes, medications are given by the aides in the building, and the nurses oftentimes will bring in an agency to take blood pressure. There are always meals in the building, snacks, 
and everything else. The delicious part, that's one of the things you have to check. That's an important difference among places. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I always encourage families to go in and have a meal, sit in in the dining room, talk to people, try a meal, see what is on the lunch and the dinner menu. Are there meals and are there choices that somebody will like having? Um, there is always people in the building 24-7, so if somebody falls in the middle of the night, needs some assistance, um, wakes up and just needs a little bit of one-to-one, -one, you know, conversation, there is always someone in the building. If you're independent, you can cook by yourself. In the independent, you can cook by yourself. Oftentimes, the independent will have a stove um, and full refrigerator. It's almost like in a, some of them are apartment, you know, where it's a small apartment. The traditional models, some have a, maybe a two burner stove. Some traditionals do not have, you know, even a cooktop and they may have a microwave and a small refrigerator. Because remember, three meals are in the dining room in the assisted living. So the idea is that you don't, you're not going to be doing a lot of cooking. The traditional model, um, it's like living in your house. The medical piece is still managed by the family. Some assisted livings have physicians coming into the building. Some assisted livings you still continue and you always have the right and the ability to go out and see your own physician in the community and to manage your meds and to ask the questions that you would to your physician as if you were living back in your own house. You still see your own specialists. Um, and if you should have a wound, the visiting nurses can come in just as if you were in your own house to come in and do the treatment to the wound. Or if somebody's a new diabetic, they can help with the blood sugars. Um, if you need physical therapy, all those services come into the assisted living just as if you were living in your own house in the community. The third is the memory loss unit. And this is often for people whose memory loss has progressed, a dementia that has progressed where they're not able to take care of themselves. They need 24-7 ongoing help. The memory units provide unlimited care throughout the day and help at night. There's still three delicious meals, but there's a higher staff ratio on the memory loss because the residents on that unit require more care. The activities on that unit also are geared for the people with memory loss. So that the activities, there's a, the activities are there to meet the needs of the seniors who are on that unit because of memory loss. How high is that ratio? You have to ask each facility. An excellent question. That's right. That's a, <laughs> staff ratios are not, man, you know, the, the, man, not necessarily mandated by the state. So you really want to talk to, about them. The blended community, as I said, is here, which is a wonderful option for people who are sort of in that gray area. Not everybody is completely independent or needs some help with the traditional assisted living. So Carriage House offers this blended community, which is really very nice um, for many individuals. How do you find a good assisted living? Think about who your person, who your relative is. If they've always been social, if they've always joined clubs, if they've always been out in bowling leagues, then you want an act a facility that has a lot of activities because that's who they are and that's what they need. If somebody's always been home every day, not very social, family very important, activities are important, but does someone come to their apartment if they choose to stay in their apartment every day? You know, you don't want anybody to be isolated, but we're not going to change people. So you want to be able to find the facility that will really be able to meet the needs of who that person is. Um, if they never had friends and the friends was not, a, they never had a large social network, they may not have a large social network where they move, but that's okay. If they make one or two friends, that's wonderful. Questions to ask on a tour is the staff ratio. Do they do quarry checks, which is checking that there's no criminal background? Look at the cost, look at the menus, and look at the activities. Ask about medications. How are they dispensed? Ask about how often rent could be increased. Is it yearly? Is it as needs change? 
you need to know that so you can prepare some sort of budget and not have any surprises financially. Ask about who's in the building. Ask if physicians come into the building. And ask them about a complaint. Because as we know, issues come up, but how they get resolved is very important. Most important, read the agreement. Have an elder law attorney read it because the agreements are written by lawyers from the assisted living. The elder law attorney, such as Arthur, is reading it to protect your relative, and that is most important. Ask about fees. Ask about the service plan. Ask about private help. This is all here, um, things that you may think about. But again, these are important questions so that there's very little surprise on the day that your relative moves into the facility. And now I want to turn it over to Arthur. Just for a moment. Um, just a couple of things about what, about what Deb just mentioned. Um, so when you're trying to figure out the right assisted living, one of your questions is going to be, so what are all the right questions? Um, because you hate, you don't know because you're just going into an assisted living facility. So that's one of the reasons why where a geriatric care manager could be really helpful because they've, just based on experience, as you can see from hearing Deb, They've, they've seen those situations that things haven't gone well, and the question really should have been asked ahead of time, how is that exactly going to work? Second thing that I just mentioned is that, you, once again, for example, there were these whole questions about proximity. I, many, many folks I have found, I, I, in, in an earlier life, I did quite a bit of real estate permitting also when I was younger. Actually, we permitted the first assisted living facility in the area around where I live. We were all assuming at that time that most of the residents we're going to be all the locals who are all going to move in because it was their local residence. And right now, that place has been there for 15 years, and 70% of those folks did not come from the area. They came to get close to their relatives, right? Because they have a son or a daughter, and they want to be close to them, but not really close, right? They don't want to be in the house, right? But you want to have somebody that's close. So it may be that you've got a, a great assisted living, and you may need to be weighing that out. Your immediate tendency may be to say, I'm going to go to the one that's the closest, to where my son or my daughter lives. But as Deb said, it's, it may not be the right fit. You know, it's like shopping for college. You're shopping, not for, you're shopping for a place to live. And, you, and there's, you, you're going to know when that's the right place. You're just going to know. So uh, I want to introduce Beth Vellante. Beth is the wonderful executive director here at the Carriage House so that she can talk a little bit about this place, because it may be that this is the right place. And certainly, if you've, you're coming here from Wayland, or you've got family in Wayland, it's certainly convenient. Beth. Thank you, Arthur. Hi, um, I'm Beth Vellante, and I'm the executive director here at Carriage House, and I have been an executive director for 29 years, so I've been doing this. Beth Vellante. No, it's not on there. Well, I can make sure you get my, my information. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Beth Vellante. And I'm the executive director here. I've been an executive director for 29 years. I've been doing this for a long time. And I just love being the director here at Carriage House. I think we're a really special community. And I want to talk to you a little bit about what makes us special. Uh, the services that I'm going to tell you about, all assisted living communities offer. But I think we have some really, uh, some things about us that make us uh, special and, and really make us stand out uh, in comparison to the other communities. Uh, the meals that we serve here are incredible, and I would encourage anyone who's going to uh, possibly consider moving here to come and have a meal in our dining room. The residents love the food here. It's all made from scratch. We have an Eat Fresh, Eat Local program, so everything <coughs> here is freshly prepared. We have amazing chefs. Our dining room, uh, dining services director comes through the dining room and knows all the residents and it's, it's just incredible food, and the residents love the food here, and that's a difficult thing to accomplish, but, but they really do. And he's so personally involved with the residents that actually he's planning a cookout for them at his house, where he lives down in Plymouth, and he's right on the ocean, and um, he's planning to bring the residents down uh, to his house this summer for a cookout. And that, I think, is another thing that makes us special. We're a small community. 
We have 33 traditional apartments. We have 20, 29 apartments uh, that serve our memory impaired residents. So we're small and we know all of our residents really well, which is why we can take people you know, to our homes for cookouts. And we went to Foxwood yesterday and everyone had a great time. And one of our residents won $600, so she did really well. But uh, these are the kinds of things that we, um, we can offer here at Carriage House. And to me, I think the most important thing when you're looking at assisted living is, is the community focused on the residents and the people? Because to me, that's what it's all about. We are a big family here. We know all of our residents, the staff who, who work here. My expectation is this is their home away from home and this is their second family, because that's how I feel about the <coughs> residents here. And I think when you're a small community, you can really go the extra mile, listen to residents, be spontaneous. If there's a trip they want to take on a Saturday, we can do it. We, we can just load up the bus and we go and we do it all the time. So, um, and I think that makes us really special. Um, our wellness and our exercise programs, we have a program every morning there's an exercise class. We have a gym upstairs where we have a bicycle and a treadmill and a weight machine. Uh, so we have lots of different programs to keep residents physically active. Uh, cultural and educational activities, again, we listen to our residents here, and the, the residents here really love uh, trips to museums. They like lectures. We have a historian who comes in and talks about uh, different historical, um, you know, uh, uh, characters. And um, we, uh, we go out to concerts. We have mus musicians come in here. We have classical musicians come in here. We had chamber musicians come in here from Yale. Uh, this afternoon we had a wine tasting. Uh, one of our family members is an expert and we had a wonderful program uh, on wine tasting and the differences in, in the different types of wines. And he's going to come back and do another program. So there are just so many programs that we offer here and they're all based upon what our residents are telling us they want. We're a small company, we're not a big chain, and everything is individualized. And I love that because it really allows us to be personal and offer that personal touch to our residents. Uh, the personal care assistants, we have uh, wonderful uh, CNAs who work here and take care of the residents. We have a nurse here uh, from 8 in the morning until 8 o'clock at night, but there's always a nurse on call. There's always a manager on duty on the weekends. And our, our cert certified nursing assistants do things like help residents with showers, uh, remind them to take their medications, provide them with assistance if they need it, uh, getting dressed in the morning or getting ready for bed at night. Uh, but we have a wonderful staff here. Uh, we have very good staffing ratios, and we really pride on ourselves on our ability to provide high quality care. Uh, medication monitoring is we remind the residents to take their medications, but there is something called LMA, which is limited medication assistance, which our nurses can do, where they can actually, with the doctor's order, give a pill to a resident. And we have only a handful of residents who need that, but that is available as well. For people who might need a break or that want to try us out, we have a 30-day minimum short-stay respite program where we provide a furnished apartment and people can come and see if they like us. And most people decide to stay when they, when they come here for a respite. Uh, and we also have a full-time social coordinator, uh, program director. And I think of all the things that we do, it's a beautiful community, obviously, but I think the social opportunities that we offer the residents are so important. People in this area can afford to stay at home. They can bring in help, uh, but they still aren't getting the social interaction that they can get in a community like this. The short stay, that is where someone comes for a minimum 30 days and we provide everything from cable, telephone, furnished apartment, all the services are provided. And it, it, yeah, but it's a 30 day stay and they get, they get to come here and live and see what it's like. Think of it as a really long vacation. Yes, mm -hmm. right. really <laughs> long vacation. Being at home, come for a month. And we'll spoil you. <laughs> But anyway, so you get to do that, enjoy all the programs, and, um, and as I was saying, the social opportunities here are so important. Services, we do have 24-hour staffing. There is someone here uh, 24 hours a day, awake staff. Uh, we have scheduled transportation. Our bus is running seven days a week, and we do everything from Dunkin' Donuts to going to the Wayside Inn to going to the Museum of Fine Arts to the Aquarium. Uh, you name it, we do it. If the residents are interested and they want to do it, we make it happen. Uh, computer training, we have a brain gym here. We'll teach residents to use computers. We have computers, but most of our residents have their own computers, and we do have free Wi-Fi here, so most of them have it in their apartments. 
Uh, the housekeeping service, our housekeepers come in and we vacuum and dust, change the beds, uh, and we provide, we change the beds and launder the, the towels and the bed linens. There are uh, laundry facilities here. People usually do their own personal laundry, but that's also available at an extra charge. We have full-time maintenance staff. Uh, during this wonderful winter that we had, our maintenance staff cleaned off all the cars, shoveled the walks, did everything. Our residents didn't have to worry about anything at all. And of course, all the other beautiful community um, features and amenities that we have. Now, we have this beautiful community that has a library and a living room and a cafe and a community room and um, beautiful dining room. But we also have apartments. So the residents have their own private space in addition to all of this space, which is also part of their home. And the scale here is nice. If you walk through our community, you'll see that it's, it, it feels like your home. And even our living room where we have many of our programs, we all watch the Super Bowl together. I watched the Super Bowl with them because there was a snowstorm coming. So I packed my bag and came here. And I watched the Super Bowl with the residents. And I went upstairs to my apartment. And I didn't make it to the end in the living room with some of them. They lasted longer than I did. But uh, I did make it to the end upstairs. But, um, but anyway, we have these spaces. And really watching that with them or watching movies with them, it, it just felt like when you're at home watching the game or, or a movie with your family. And that's really how it feels here. But our residents do have their own apartments to go to whenever they want to. And our traditional apartments do have kitchenettes. They have a microwave, a stovetop, a full-size refrigerator, lots of cabinetry, and, um, and a sink. Uh, there is no oven, but there's a country kitchen here that people are wel uh, welcome to use whenever they want to. And there's also phone and cable access. And we have studios, one and two bedroom apartments. Our Avita program, which is our program for memory impaired residents, is, uh, is, is large studios. We do not have uh, kitchenettes on Avita, but we have a very, very high staffing ratio. I had a question about staffing. Uh, the staffing for our memory care program would be uh, one CNA during the day and evening for, um, for every CNA, certified CNA. nursing assistant for every seven residents, plus a program assistant, plus Jazz, who's our program director. Uh, so that's a very high staffing ratio. That's, uh, what, three people for, for um, yeah, that's a, that's a very high staffing ratio, about five to one. So, and that it far exceeds any, there are no requirements, but it, it far exceeds the recommendations of the Alzheimer's Association. Thank you very much. Beth, I appreciate it. And by the way, we're just going to go back to that slide. Just a couple of things about what Beth said. Um, first of all, so I can't do this, but my paralegal, who's a techie, can do this. You can actually go onto their website. See that little, the, the little apartment? And you can take your furniture and you can try to fit it into the apartment and you can kind of design your own apartment layout. It's very, I can't do it, but, and maybe you can, or maybe your kids can help you do it. It's very entertaining. Um, the second thing is my, uh, uh, so a personal statement, my cousin and his wife live here now, and they're actually in the memory care unit. It is in, was inconceivable to me that they would ever leave their condominium. Inconceivable. And they are here, and they are happy here, and that's been quite an amazing thing to see. Um, as Beth had said, you want to really shop it. So the, the idea of, whether it's here or any place, staying for a while, and not when it's an emergency. Not when, I mean, you know, they're happy to see you. They're, because they're, they want to be, you, they want to know that when you decide you want to be in assisted living, this is the place. And by the way, the same applies to their competition. They want to see you too. So you may want to just say to yourself, I'm going to take a little vacation. I'm going to go visit this place. It's going to cost you a little bit. But you get a feel for what might be the right place at the point at which, you know, you might be really kind of thinking about leaving. So uh, that's about assisted living, except Let's get to what is always the, the kind of the 600 pound rhinoceros in the room, which is, oh, but I'll, I can't possibly afford this. I can't possibly afford this. So I have two kind of general observations about this. First of all, don't make this a kind of a psychological problem. This is simply a math issue. So before you say that, figure out the math, right? And do it with somebody who does this stuff, right? so that you make sure you get the math right. So I'm going to give you, for example, here, so here's Frank and Mary again, you know, and there's their assets, and they've got a, that $600,000 house, and they've got, you know, $350,000 in cash, um, and they've got income of $3,000 a month. So say that their assisted living uh, apartment um, was going to be $6,000 a month. 
I needed to use some number, so I picked six. So, and that's, you know, because and they're saying to themselves, oh my God, that's more than we earn. We're going to burn through this in no time. So start off by assuming when you come to assisted living, one of the things I tell my clients is that, you know, it's going to cost you a lot of money, but by the way, all your other bills kind of go away, right? Because you're not paying the taxes anymore, or the insurance or anything else. You're still going to be spending some money, but it tends to go way down. So assume that in this case, um, Frank and Mary are assuming that, that that's their assisted living cost is $6,000 a month or $72,000 a year, and that they're still figuring they're going to spend $1,000 a month on fun. They're not going to be driving around as much. They're not going to be going out to eat as much because the restaurant's always here, but they're going to want to. You know, they're going to want to do some stuff. So say that their run rate is going to be $84,000, and they know that they've got income of $36,000, so 84 minus 36 is that $48,000 figure. And Frank and Mary are saying to themselves, you know, we're still feeling pretty good. We can live for a long time. We don't want to run out of money before we run out of time here, right? And so they're figuring, well, in this case, um, their assets, their $350,000 that they have in cash, um, divided by that burn rate of $48,000 means they'd be out of money in 7.29 years. And they're saying to themselves, well, that's just not long enough. That's just not long enough. But suppose, remember in this scenario, they've still got their house because they're saying to themselves, oh, if I don't like that assisted living, I want to go back to my house. I want to know my house is still there. Well, if they still have their house, then suppose they just went to the bank, which of course they're eligible for since they don't have to qualify based on income uh, because this would be a line of credit loan. So the bank's going to qualify them for this just based on their equity. Suppose they take a $300,000 equity loan out of their house. It's a $600,000 house. They're all going to get that loan. Every day they're going to get that loan. Current interest rate is 4% on those loans and they're all interest only. So they're going to be paying a $1,000 a month monthly payment by doing that. But what they're also doing, uh, so that they're increasing their cost of living because now, because now they've got this mortgage payment of $12,000, um, plus they've got all of that assisted living and uh, fun, right? Uh, but, and their income has stayed the same. It's only $36,000, right? Except they've now got a pool of money that just went up from $350,000 to $650,000 because they took out the money from the line of credit. They got their original $350,000, which they had, plus their extra $300,000. So they now have $650,000. Divide that by um, what their, by that burn rate, which is now $60,000, remember the burn rate went up because now they have to pay this loan. Um, now their assets, though, last for 10.83 years, right? Still not long enough for them because they're like, we're going to live at least 20 more years. This, is just, this isn't going to work. Well, so go to possibility number three, that at some point after they've been here for a while, they decide, well, we're not going to go back to our house. Right? We're actually going to sell our house because now we've been in assisted living for three or four years and it looks okay. Right? And of course when they sell their house, they're each entitled to a $250,000 capital gains exemption. So their $600,000 house, presumably they bought it for, for, for $100,000 or more, which means they're going to pay zero in taxes and all that money is available. Which means that they now have this kind of, this, this larger pot of money, they've got income still of, of, of $36,000. They've got minus their assisted living of $84,000, right? Their burn rate is now only, is now um, still $48,000. They no longer have their monthly mortgage payment, their monthly equity line, right, payment. And they now have a pile of money, which is $950,000, right? Now this isn't some kind of far-fetched strategy. This is simply Frank and Mary having finally decided they're going to live in the assisted living. So they've got $950,000, their burn rate is $48,000. Oh look, they can, they can be there for 20 years, for 20 years, right? Now once again, we would all sometimes want to think that we're going to live forever, but chances are that's not going to happen in Frank and Mary's case and that this is going to be sufficient and they can live and die in this place, right? Now, once again, if you're thinking about it in those terms, you want to say to yourself when you're looking for assisted living, is this place so nice that I could really consider it home, right? And when I mean home, I mean a place that is so nice 
that I could be really frail here, that I could feel really safe here. So those are the kinds of things that you want to be looking for when you're looking for that assisted living because you don't want to move again. That's the main thing. If you're Frank and Mary, you were in that house for 40 years. You don't want to move again after this, right? But it all works for 20 years. But, but now I'm going to give you one other scenario, which people very seldom think of because they don't know it works. And it relates to Frank and Mary saying to themselves, well, this is all well and good, but what if I get sicker, right? What if I need more assistance? What if, what if Mary has Mary's Mary's memory really has gone so that she really needs to be in the memory care unit? Or what if either of them has gotten so frail that they need regular assistance with at least two of those, the list was used earlier but it wasn't referred to, the activities of daily living. There are, you, I mean, you, you would say to yourself and you say, well, activities of daily living, isn't that everything that I do daily? Well, actually, for, for professional, in, in, in these circles, Activities of daily living really means six particular activities. Um, dressing, bathing, eating, toileting, um, and, and um, uh, transferring. Transferring means getting out of a chair, walking across a room, sitting down. If you need regular assistance with at least two of those activities of daily living, in the opinion of any health professional, does not have to be a doctor, can be a, a nurse, right? In the opinion of any health professional, and if you're in an assisted living community where the price of those, that extra assistance is bundled in with your assisted living payment, then for income tax purposes, your entire payment monthly is a medical deduction, a medical deduction that can be subtracted from your income. Now, that's not going to help Frank and Mary a whole lot because they don't have a whole lot of income, right? But remember, they had those three kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. One of them happens to be a lawyer, um, and he lives here in Massachusetts, and he and his wife are doing okay. So what if, and, and, and in my scenario, they trust Peter, right? So this doesn't work unless you trust Peter, right? But what if, what if they took the money that they had, this large pile of money that they had, uh, and they gave it to Peter, right? Now, there is nothing, there's no tax on any of that money when they give it to Peter. There's contrary to public, uh, kind of a, there's a myth that if you give somebody more than $14,000 in a year, you pay some kind of tax on it. You don't, unless the total amount you're giving over your lifetime is over like $5 million. So it's an irrelevant number. And the receipt of a gift is not income. So there's nothing bad tax-wise that happens to Frank or Mary or to Peter by doing this. So you give the money to Peter. And then you have Peter every year pay the assisted living bill. Now, as long as P what Peter is paying on his parents' behalf is equal to more than 50% of their total expenses, they are, for his purposes, a dependent, right? And he can subtract, he can deduct their medical expenses as medical deductions, which means that Peter now can deduct the entire assisted living bill every month as a medical deduction. If we, if we assume that he's paying all of the assisted living, remember the assisted living was $6,000 a month times 12 or $72,000. We take a third of that, which is $23,760 a year, and we have Peter give that back to his parents. Now once again, you have to trust Peter in this case, right? If you think Peter's going to go steal all your money, you can't use this, right? Um, but if you do, and maybe that's why you want to give the money to Paul or Mary, you don't just trust Peter. But in any case, if you do, and you add their income, now all of a sudden their income has gone up from $36,000 a year to $59,760. And all Peter is doing here, he's not taking any money out of his pocket. He's just taking the money that he didn't pay the federal and state government because of the deduction, and he's giving it back to his parents, right? In that situation, income plus gift is that 59,760. Remember the run rate, their burn rate, or, or their, their total cost for, for assisted living plus fund was $84,000, right? Their burn rate is now only $24,240 a month, and they can stay in their unit for 39.19 years. Now, it may be that as a result of getting this additional assistance in the assisted living facility, the cost of the unit has gone up. It may no longer be 6,000, it may be seven, it may be eight. The point is, do the math. 
Do the math. And if you're thinking about it into the future, work with somebody to, to get these numbers right, right? And don't start off by assuming that you can't afford it. Do the math first. Do the math first, okay? Uh, the, there is a fina final strategy, but it's too complicated to talk about. And that is, if, your, if you or your spouse was a veteran, if you served in the armed forces, active duty for at least 90 days, and if at least one of those days happened during a period of war, um, then you are, either one of you, either the veteran or the spouse is entitled to a benefit called the, the aid and attendance benefit. That benefit can be as much as $2,000 per month. I am told, and I'll take, I'll be glad to take those questions because you're, you're say, shaking your head no, so I want to know about that. I am told um, that for that very reason, nationally, over 60% of all units in assisted living facilities are be, the, the people there are getting the, the aid and attendance benefit. But if you, want, if you have questions about this, don't ask me. The, whenever I talk about this, I say, talk to a professional. That's the right person. I, I, once again, there isn't a list of three. Talk to her. Um, a couple of final things. If you want to see this presentation, again, Frank and Mary actually have their own YouTube channel. It's called Elder Law Frank and Mary. And this will be posted up there very shortly after this presentation. Frank and Mary also uh, walk in the annual Alzheimer's walk because they realize that the goal of all of us is to make sure that in the next generation, no one is suffering from the, the dementia that so many people are getting hit with right now. And if you want to participate, please let us know. Thank you very much. The goal of all of this is peace of mind. If there are no other questions. Thank you very, very much for coming. Thank you very much to my wonderful guests for appearing here. And I hope that this has been helpful. I know we're, I, I think we're planning on doing another one perhaps specifically devoted to memory care, and we'll be doing that in the fall. Thank you very much. Thank you.